Okay, I'm going to just give an overview of CryptoDev. I gave a talk last year, just before we did our first release, talk about come some of the developments that happened over the last year and some future work that we're planning to do um, over the, com the coming months and year. Um, okay. So the CryptoDev framework really is, a, it's a framework for doing symmetric crypto workloads um, in DP, on DPDK applications. So it defines a standard API, which can support both uh, hardware accelerated looks like devices and software based crypto. Um, it's got, it's, it's transparent to the application what type of crypto device underlying, underlying crypto devices the process is happening on. It provides the infrastructure uh, for pull mode drivers, um, supports symmetric uh, crypto operations, both cipher authentication and AEAD uh, op types, uh, supports chaining of authentication and cipher operations, and provides the session management. But fundamentally, it's an asynchronous burst API uh, in the same vein as our ETHEV APIs for processing crypto operations. And this allows us to amortize the cost of multi processing multiple packets in parallel. Uh, and this gives you, gives you the same performance uh, boost that you get for offloading, when, as you get for offloading actual bursts of packets to NICs. You can allow this to crypto devices. So this is just kind of a diagram to show the pipeline of a crypto processing. So we've got a packet coming in uh, on, on the far left. And, and the first thing that you need to do, identify um, is the session that that packet belongs to. So this could be uh, IP, if it was an IPsec flow, uh, each security association would have a crypto session corresponding to that. So the SA would be your identifier for the crypto station session. So when you want to actually do some crypto operation on that packet, you need to create a crypto op. You need to attach the session. You need to attach the packet and set the offloads and lengths of for what type of operation, the, where on the packet you want to do the operation. Um, and then that um, packet will be enqueued to the crypto PMD. So this first stage, we, you would, as with you would do with an ETHDEV, you tend to operate in bursts here. So you, in queuing to your crypto PMD in the middle, you're going to be queuing a burst of 16 or 32 packets, depending on how you design your system. Um, just the slightly pink dotted line this is just to show that the, the crypto processing is, is, is asynchronous. So for a software CPU-based crypto, um, depending on how the crypto device is defined, you could be doing processing on the in queue or the DQ. Uh, all of our current software crypto Pomo drivers work by doing encryption on the in queue of the packet. But there's no reason why if for a particular application, it, depending if you're using your crypto uh, crypto stage to break up a pipeline, you could that could be modified and you could do the crypto processing on the DQ side. Um, you're still, you're, uh, and this, th that mode would fit in why, quite well with the hardware accelerator where you're enqueuing packets to to a hardware device and at some point later you're dequeuing them. So in the dequeue stage, you're going to get some status back to say whether um, the crypto operation has succeeded, succeeded and then you can egress your packet to the next stage and you should also free that crypto up. So just the, the, the session, it tends to be uh, mutable um, data that's kept around for the lifetime of the flow. Your crypto op is on a per packet basis. So we have infrastructure uh, in the crypto dev uh, framework for uh, creating crypto op pools, so you can use the same sort of strategies you use for MBOF pools for uh, efficiently managing the, those crypto op structures. So this is a diagram that kind of shows a kind of simple application that is doing some sort of crypto processing on how the packets would flow. So I'm just trying to show you, but some sort of physical device here on the left. Uh, which maps into a pull mode driver. Your, your application is taking packets off that using the ETF API. The application is doing whatever your application needs to be doing. It could be in some of it was an IPsec gateway. You, you could be going through your IPsec stack and the, the IPsec stack would be offloading packets for crypto processing. So on the left here, you've got a, I have shown the SNI multi-buffer PMD. The packet is going 
through there and it'll get processed in, in, in series with, in that processing loop with the QuickAssist PMD. Uh, this is showing the, the entire QuickAssist hardware accelerator and packets are sent down to the physical device for processing and asynchronously received off the descriptor ring and can be injected back into the application. So this shows that in, in this case, if whether you're using doing your CP crypto processing on core or offloading to hardware device, the, the API layer is exactly the same. And in this case, you'd only be using the device ID to um, differentiate from a software or hardware de device. So you don't need there's, there's, there doesn't need to be intelligence on the data plane on where the crypto processing is happening. So this slide just kind of gives you the high level blocks that uh, are defined by the crypto dev. API. So you've got all your device management for the creation of crypto devices, configuration of the device, your Q pair management. So one differentiation between, say, a crypto device and an Ether device is the Q pair. So your ingress queue and egress queue are um, intrinsically linked. Packets that go in an ingress queue, say zero, will always come be dequeued from Q zero. Um, the, uh, on like a a ether device or where it, JTX or X cubes are not really linked, they're, they're independent uh, from packet flow point of view. We have APIs around the device capabilities, um, some for retrieving statistics, both from the device and queue pairs. Then we have our definitions of our supported algorithm types, uh, then the APIs for creating sessions. Um, so that's setting up what, what type of crypto transform you want to do on your packet. Um, and then the crypto operation stuff, which I mentioned in the previous diagram. And then the actual in queue, DQ processing operations. So just kind of to give an, a status update on the development progress over the last year from when I talked at uh, 2015 user space event. So in release 2.2, we upstream the experimental release of the CryptoDev, which included the ASNI multi-buffer POMO driver, uh, which supported the ASCBC and some of the HMAC SHA functions. Uh, this is that's a vectorized library, um, which is, so uses the intrinsic uh, sorry, uses Intel vector instructions to accelerate the processing, and also the QAT PMD, which is the a pole pole driver for Intel's Quick Assist technology devices, uh, which is hardware accelerator. In 1604, we went to Stable. We added three further pole mode drivers: the AS and I GCM for GCM, AES GCM, um, AEAD operations, and null PMD, which just really allow for testing and uh, some performance analysis. And Snoop 3G. POMO driver, which was a POMO driver to support the wireless 3, Snow 3G protocol, or uh, crypto algorithms. And then we also extended the Quick Assist POMO driver some further algorithm um, ex ex en enablement. In 1607, we had Kazumi, which is another wireless algorithm uh, enablement, uh, and further uh, enablement of the Quick Assist PMD. And for 1611, just preempting Thomas here, Tom, a little bit here. The, so we're planning for the Kazumi PMD. We have our Open SSL PMD, which this is um, an interesting one. That basically it's providing a shim into lib crypto operations um, through the Crypto Dev API. So all of the actual processing, if you have Open SSL installed on your box, uh, maybe if you're not vector capable, capable you still be able to access the full suite of crypto, symmetric crypto functionality that uh, LibCrypto provides through this BMD. Um, and then we also have some further uh, quick assist uh, POMO driver enablement for hardware accelerator. Um, on the, the actual framework itself, the main major change from what I presented last year to today is around the in-Q burst API. So, Initially, the RFC um, and the experimental release used bursts of uh, MBUFs um, to in queue and DQ from the crypto device. But this had uh, introduced some complexities around the management of metadata, attaching it to MBUFs, 
and making sure that metadata was correctly um, it read uh, when the, that mbuff life had was completed. So we moved to using the burst of crypto ops directly. Um, this just simplifies things and uh, for the crypto processing it tends to be most applications use it, you, you enqueue some packets to do crypto processing. When crypto processing is complete, you've got the status back from that and you don't need the crypto op to be attached, associated with that mbuff after that point. So it, it made sense, that change. Um, so today we now have, uh, uh, well, as of the 1611 release, we should have eight poll mode drivers in, in, upstream to DPDK. Um, or the first two, the GCM, SNI, GCM, multi-buffer, they both take advantage of Intel's SNI instructions and they, they both use vector instructions to accelerate the processing of the crypto instructions. Um, we have Kasumi, Snow 3G and Zook, their uh, enabling of uh, wireless uh, crypto processing algorithms. And then, as I mentioned, the null, quick, uh, null PMD just really is a, a test function device. And then Quick Assist, which is Intel's hardware accelerator. Um, and this is just a slide uh, listing out a lot of the uh, symmetric so the cipher algorithms, um, the authentication algorithms, and some of the AEAD algorithms that are supported. So as you can see, there's, we haven't been sitting uh, on our feet over the last year. We've done a lot of enablement work um, and plan to continue that. So going forward, I'm, I'm going to talk about a few of the things that are in progress and in planning. Um, so one of the, I think one of the, one of the main things that's uh, critical for the enablement of the crypto dev is, is scattered gather support. So uh, it allows us to address the issues it, in network when we're dealing with uh, IP fragmented packets and most reassembly li li um, libraries are just going to create a chain of MBUFs. So currently our software POMO drivers don't uh, support um, this chain of MBUF, uh, right? So we're, we're, we're working hopefully on, for the 1702 release, we'll have both um, hardware support and the Quixis POMO driver, which will natively support um, the scatter gather and on our SNI multi buffer and our um, the, or the open SSL pull mode driver will have native support for scatter gather. The other devices, for, the other software pull mode drivers will require coalescing of MBUFs if, if, if scatter gather is requ required. Um, on the AES and IGCM pull mode driver, we're planning to migrate to Intel's ICL crypto library. This will, it uses essentially the same um, implementation of the AES GCM 128 uh, uh, functionality, but it also will enable uh, the 256 bit, uh, 256-bit uh, GCM. Um, we're planning also enabling cipher-only authentication only operations to the SNI multi-buffer PMD, which currently only supports chained operations. Um, we're, we're also hoping to upload uh, hot plug support for the crypto dev framework. Um, and part of that, I, I want to upload at, uh, extensions to the, the DPDK uh, L2 forward crypto application, which actually demonstrates one of the key functionalities of what the crypto dev framework enables, which is the migration of flow, crypto flows between a hardware accelerator and, a, and on, on CPU processing transparently to the application. Um, and I'll actually be giving a demo in a couple of weeks at the IEEE NFE conference show demonstrating that functionality working. Um, and then we're, as we're continuing to look at extending and performance enhancements to the crypto framework um, and we're looking at if there, is there's a way that we can improve the actual crypto op structures to make uh, processing more efficient. Um, also in the 1702 time frame we're planning to release a crypto performance application and this is it's taking some work that's currently in the test application in DPDK and migrating it into a standalone application 
or, or possibly integrating into test PMD. But the, the, the idea of this is, is allow anyone to take any Pomo driver and do their own benchmarks of performance. So the idea we have is a, a kind of modular framework with uh, tests which are performance tests which are agnostic to an underlying device. And they will allow you to create, get, calculate throughput, um, maybe initially throughput and, and latency performance measurements. And at the bottom, this is just uh, it's, it's just giving an idea of what it might look like. So I'm saying I'm specifying performance test, the type of device I want to do the test on, and then the type of crypto operation. And then you can change the number of operations, burst sizes, buffer sizes, and, and that'll allow you to get a good feel for any particular crypto device that someone's developing actual performance that's achievable. Um, and then the, the last part of some of the future work that we're looking on, looking at that I want to talk about today, is uh, the enablement of a crypto scheduler. So the, the idea of this is, allow, is, is to allow multiple crypto devices to be slaved under a single virtual device in the same similar fashion to link bonding, where you can bond multiple Ethernet devices together to appear as one device. Um, with with the idea that we can come up with uh, intelligent scheduling mechanisms to 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 uh, balance crypto workload across those devices, so we're we're looking at kind of per queue, per flow, and per and per packet scheduling paradigms, seeing investigating what is going to give kind of the the best performance. Um, and with that, with this, we're, we're try, we want to make the actual the framework very flexible because the, the, what we, even from initial investigation, what, what we find is the type of scheduling that you might want to do is very dependent on your application and the crypto devices you have available. Um, so we, we, we were, and, and we want to be able to allow, possibly even go to the point that allow that the, on creation of the device a user to load in their own scheduling uh, routine. Uh, what we're looking at uh, modes of investigation, so I call fat flow. So if you have one very large flow and you have hardware accelerators that you want to uh, balance, load balance across, that, that's one possible scheduling paradigm. Um, possibly another one is a software, software fallback. So if you have an oversubscribed hardware accelerator, it's been utilized by multiple applications. That if a device, if a if you an EQ fails in hardware accelerator, you may then fall back to doing that burst on software that would allow the 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 EQ to um, drain, and the next operation could uh, will then should be able to successfully go to the, the hardware device. Um, so in most cases, if you're using a hard, hardware accelerator. If the device is not fully subscribed, it's always going to be more efficient to go to that hardware accelerator um, because the cost of enqueuing a crypto operation, depending on the device, is probably always going to be less than doing the actual crypto on CPU. So um, that's something we're looking at. And then also maybe a more heuristic based packet scheduling, looking at patch, packet sizes, the session types, so the type of crypto operation you're going to do in, and utilization of the POMO drivers that they are slaves to the crypto device. So looking at those um, parameters and, and uh, making an intelligent decision based on that. Or the, the, and the last mode possibly to look at is that if you're doing pure um, software, then you could use some sort of distributor to use, utilize many cores. And my last slide is just uh, kind of a showing what that might look like. Scheduling block, ordering logic, and then your POMO drivers underneath, and then the ability to plug in different schedulers. Um, and for the 1702, we're hoping to upstream this load balancing scheduler, which is will allow for something like Intel's upcoming Denverton platform, which has three hardware accelerators, that you could, for a single flow, maybe utilize the full bandwidth potential of those devices through a single device. So that's me done. Um, I guess we can save the questions to the end, or, or if we'll. <laughs> yeah, so we can save the, and I'll hand over to Danny. The fact that uh, you have this crypto PMD, uh, does it impose any uh, export restrictions because you have 256-bit support? 
So in TPD Code, we, uh, I haven't shown it in these diagrams, but if I actually go back to the first. We don't actually upstream any of the, actually I don't have it in this side deck. We don't upstream any of the actual underlying uh, code for crypto. So they're, they're all of our Pomod drivers linked to external um, libraries. So the, if there are export restrictions there on those libraries, and more so if they're got through somewhere like 01.org or, or for instance, lib crypto, lib crypto, whatever, the open SSL restriction, are, they're all at that level because mostly what our Pomo drivers are, are just shims to utilize in either another library or to, to, to hardware device where the actual processing is happening. There are actually a lot of network cards that do some kind of IPsec offloading. For example, a lot of in the IXGB family actually support this, but there's no driver support in any open source driver. Yeah. Um, any plans to support this? There currently are not. Uh, we have. We, we think it would be possible to to do that by having a crypto device to, to manage the actual configuration of that it should be possible to enable but we haven't uh, we have we have no plans to actually do that at the moment it would require customer uh, or like it, it the, the hardware is there the specs are available if someone else wants to do it, it would be possible but it currently isn't part of the plans any of our short term plans anyway Uh, I actually have a proof of concept implementation for the IXGPE driver. Um, like I had a student do it last year or something. It was like a hundred lines of code or so. Yeah. If you are interested. Yeah, I'd be more than love to see it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So you have a question about the scheduler for that. Yeah. So you mentioned because you have multiple devices, you would rather make a decision based on which accelerators or which device you want to use, and you could do load balancing. Do you envision the case where you have different applications that are trying to use that device, and since you have multiple devices, the scheduler could make a decision such as, this application will use this device, but the other application will be using software library. And the input to this decision is coming from some orchestration entity outside. The so I guess there's, there's multiple ways you could approach that problem. There's no it, so, so, especially on on the this, this CPU based crypto accelerators, there in, you're, you're using your queues as you can use your queues as a mechanism for dividing. You're, you're going to have to use separate queues anyway for multiple applications and if they're running on different cores. But uh, you could have two scheduler devices, so each application could be on a different scheduler. Uh, if you're using hardware, if you're using hardware, you probably want a different VF for the two different applications. But I guess we could look at enabling different scheduling mechanisms on a per queue basis. If you had a different, so each application needs to use its own queue set anyway to to protect. Uh, so if if you had scheduling on a per queue basis, you could have a different mechanism for scheduling to for different applications. Yes, well, you, well we, the capabilities are, are, are there to tell, allow an orchestration layer to look at a device and see what it's capable of. So I think I'm going to get kicked off now, so <laughs> if anyone has any more questions, uh, just feel free to catch me uh, after. Okay, so I need my slides. <laughs> Enough slides? Okay, so the plan is that I will talk a bit about VPP and what VPP is, explain at a high level how it works, and then Sergio will talk about implementation of the crypto dev inside the VPP, which is currently in the review process, so it will be merged probably for the next release. So what is VPP? So uh, VPP is, uh, is basically an open source project which Cisco launched with uh, partners uh, Actually, it's a, it's a sub-project under the FDI, FDI umbrella, which was launched uh, beginning of this year. 
It was basically a sub-project which was initially Cisco closed source application, uh, which was developed for many years, so since 2002. And it's a kind of uh, user mode networking stack, uh, which can be used for, for different use cases, like vSwitch, vRouter, uh, or developing the custom, uh, custom layer 2 layer 3 applications, and, and so on. Uh, why it is called vector packet processing? Basically, uh, idea is, is, and originally the whole story started a long time ago on very limited CPUs, so the, the whole thing was actually developed on the, on the PowerPC. Uh, the idea was really to save every CPU cycle on processing packets and, uh, and the approach which uh, guys who started working on this are, was really about trying to vectorize as much as possible and, and uh, basically optimize performance in, in that way. So it's something which is quite familiar to people using DPDK because the, it's basically the same techniques, but uh, in VPP they are not tied to the device driver level, they are really the, the user space, the network stack. So, basically the same thing like in other DPDK applications, trying to be efficient as possible, save the CPU cycles on processing packets, and, uh, and, and try to do as much as possible out of the specific uh, budget of, uh, of uh, CPU cycles we have for, for, <coughs> for network packet processing. Uh, so the, the base thing in VPP and really the, the core, the, the infrastructure which is uh, basically serving all the applications is really the, the graph scheduler. It is uh, basically infrastructure which allows people to, to create the graph nodes and graph nodes are, are connected in the graph and we are basically passing the vector packets between the graph nodes. So uh, every graph node is doing a small, some small operation on the packet and making, and making decision what is the next graph node. For example, if you are receiving the, 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 the burst of packets, and in that burst you have 200 IP packets and you have R request, the, the graph node which is receiving those packets can make a decision and send IP packets to the IP node, R packets to the R node. Basically, in, in, with this approach, the graph scheduler is distributing the, the, the frames of the packets to the, to the, to, between the nodes, and we are not spending time on, on packets which are not really Interest, interesting for the specific part, part of the code. Uh, with this approach, of course, we are, we are basically do, doing uh, small operations on the packets that, that immediately means that we are not, uh, that we are avoid, uh, avoiding iCache misses because the code which was doing an operation on, on the batch of the packets is small, it fits to the, to the iCache, and, uh, and when we finish with one frame of the packets, then the graph scheduler will basically call another graph node uh, uh, function and with this approach, we are really doing the operations on the, on the vectors of packet instead of doing packet by packet, which is typically what we have in some different network stack implementations. Inside VPP, uh, uh, we have basically three types of the graph nodes. Uh, there is a normal, or what we call it as an internal graph node. It's basically a graph node which is receiving packets from another graph node and sending packets to the, to the next one. Then we have process nodes. Process nodes are kind of applications, uh, kind, kind of processes which are basically doing some maintenance work. For example, Mac aging, R paging, uh, replying to some control plane messages and so on. And finally we have input nodes which are kind of nodes which are pulling the hardware or external sources for packets and sending packets down to the, to the, graph, to the, to the graph tree. So on this, on this drawing, it's a very, very simplified way how VPP works. It basically shows the, the one sample graph of nodes, and this is actually what we have in the IPv4 part. Uh, in real world, it's much, much bigger graph, but uh, for simplicity, I basically took only some of those, those graph nodes. And if you can see on the, on the top, there is something called which is DPDK input. DPDK input is basically a graph node in the graph which is dealing with, uh, with uh, DPDK uh, receiver bursts. So DPDK graph node is really pulling the, the NIC and grabbing the, the, the burst of packets out of the NIC or some other source. And DPDK input node is already able to make a first deci decision where the, the, the packet should go. So that was the, related to my question on the previous session about uh, offload. So if we, get the, the, if, we, if, if we know that NIC is giving us uh, packets which are verified, that the checksum is okay, then and, that, and also, if Nick tells us that this is IPv4 packet, we should send the packet straight to the IPv4 input, no checksum, 
which is basically a graph node which is doing the input IP, IPv4 checks, including the TTL decrement and, uh, and all other stuff which uh, the proper network stack should do. If frame is not iter IPv4, or if frame or if NIC is not able to, to do uh, checks from offload, in that case, uh, DPDK input node will basically send the packets to the Ethernet input, which is a kind of layer two, layer two graph node, which is doing the, the basically ether, ether type lookup, and then dispatching packets to the to the different graph nodes. So Ethernet input is really the first node which is dealing with Ethernet frames, but we have this shortcut which is basically avoiding this part of the nodes which are not in, needed in this case. Here we have something which is called IPv4 input, here we have something which is called IPv4 input node checks. So the, basically the difference is that it's basically the same code with one inline uh, uh, exclusion of the uh, checksum uh, check. And basically we are trying to save CPU cycles and packets which we know that they are, they are already uh, uh, Check for checksum. So, DPDK driver can send directly to IPv4 input no checksum if there is checksum is already verified. If it is not, it will use the standard path. Uh, in both cases, next hop will be IPv4 lookup node. IPv4 lookup, lookup node is basic IPv4 fib. And, and IPv4 fib is doing the. Uh, IPv4 fib is doing. Uh, 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 lookup on the IPv4 uh, in the IPv4 lookup table, and based on the lookup table, we can have also few decisions. So basically, every fib entry in VPP have a, as a result have a adjacency, and if it is uh, passed through traffic, or if this is the local traffic. So basically, if we are receiving packet, we should go up to the to the some UDP graph node or something. In that case, uh, that packet should go to IPv4 local. So the result of the FIB lookup can be either the packets which are local, I'm going to IPv4 lookup, and, or it can, they will go to IPv4 rewrite transit. Rewrite transit is node which is basically the swapping the, swapping the, the layer to header, doing basically uh, uh, header rewrite, and then sending down to the transmit uh, node. So basically that is the idea of the graph node. We are really uh, passing packets between the graph nodes, and we are trying to do as much as possible batching. So basically, the bigger vector size, we are more efficient. Of course, if you, have the, if you receive an ARP packet, ARP will, it will be likely the one in the frame, and that one will go just to the, to the ARP node. But for IPv4 packets, for example, you will probably process, in, in highly loaded system, it will process 200 packets in, in one single vector, and really uh, boosting the performance. Another thing which is quite important and enables people to basically develop, develop even the closed source uh, plugins is, the, is basically the pl plugin infrastructure which we have, which basically allows us to, to, for people to really build the plugin, which is a sh shared library, which can be a, even a closed source. And that shared library can be loaded on runtime. And basically, in, inside the plugin, we can do almost the, all the stuff we can do in the, in the main code base. So really, there is no need to, to if you want to do some closed source value add uh, application, you, you can really create the plugin and hook it up to the, to the normal VPP release, which is open source release. Uh, plugins basically uh, can use all the infrastructure which normal VPP code can use, including the, the binary API and, uh, and graph dispatcher and multi threading and everything. So, really, the, there is no limitations on the plugin side. It may happen that, that some specific API doesn't exist, which will help you to, to do something from the plugin, but it can be easily added if, if it is missing. So really, the plugins in VPP are first-class citizens. There is no limitations for them. So this is a bit animated, okay. Uh, next important thing when you are developing the data plane is really the highly efficient API interface. So. You don't want that your data plane is stuck in, in processing some very weird uh, calls or doing uh, context switches because of uh, the interface which is not efficient. So what we basically built is a very efficient shared memory API mechanism. We are calling that a binary API. It is, there is a whole infrastructure for building new APIs, so including the, the lexical parser which we have, which is YAC based which basically allows you to really specify the, the new API definition in one file and add the, the handling functions and you have the new API. And all this stuff is available also in the, in the plugins. So plugin can also uh, 
can own APIs, can announce own API to the, <coughs> to, to the, to the, to the uh, agent which is talking to, to APP. And regarding the performance, this number is pretty old. Uh, we didn't do a recent testing. I think it, it will be even faster now, but uh, what we are getting in the past was more than 700k routes programmed in VPP per second over the binary API interface. And, and the very important thing when we talk about API is really a situation when somebody comes to you and saying some, something is not working, right? And instead of reproducing the whole system, including the, the control plane or uh, controller, uh, agent, management agent, whatever, what we can do on VPP is really the, the, the API tracing. So you can, you can basically say to the, somebody who is on site with the customer, say, okay, just capture the, the API trace, and you will get the raw data of exactly the all API messages which are coming from the control plane, and then you can reply this in your own, own testbed. So there is no need to have the whole, uh, whole reproduction in your testbed. You can just basically reply the, the API sequence and re <coughs> recreate the issue or, or confirm that there is no issue again, right? Uh, from the platform side, uh, as I said, originally everything started as uh, PowerPC. Uh, development, uh, we are trying to be uh, Indian safe, we are trying to work on multiple platforms. So we have, uh, of course, the x86 is uh, our current focus. But we have the ARM working, we have the, uh, everything working on the PowerPC. And also we have a MIPS, I think MIPS was only uh, tested in, in recently with uh, QM emulators, so it's not uh, tested on the, on the real hardware. And uh, one inter interesting thing which I wanted to highlight in this slide is really something which we did recently about really trying to, to use best of the different multi-architectures uh, from the binary. So the, the problem is that when you have the, when you're distributing the, the, the package in the, I don't know, Ubuntu Red Hat or something, uh, the guy who is making decision to, to do a packaging needs to decide if the code will be AVX2, it will, the code will be just SSC3, or it will work on every single x86, right? And this is a binary distribution. So uh, on one side you have a drawback that it will be slower, on the other side you, have a, you, you will not work on all platforms. What we did in VPP is basically runtime uh, detection of the runtime detection of the uh, available micro architectures, and if you detect, for example, that, uh, that the CPU where we are running is AVX2, we will basically use the different graph node function, which was optimized for AVX2. And we do this in automatic way, so there is no single line of code needed to really to convert the, the one function to be AVX2 optimized. If there is no AVX2, we are falling back to the default, and currently for default we are using uh, uh, SSC, so basically in the Hallam uh, uh, kind of optimizations. Uh, this is done for all the all VPP graph functions, but it is not done for TPDK. So it will be nice that we have similar possibility on the TPDK side to really on the runtime decide which version of the of the function we want to run depending on the available instructions on the on the computer. Uh, another thing to mention, currently we are Linux only, I don't see big issues in doing the free BSD, just somebody needs to do the work, and I, I'm getting new information that there are some interested people to do that work. And another thing which is in interesting is that we have also, and that is legacy from the previous time, we have a basic support for, for, uh, for writing own PCI device drivers, and that comes to my second slide, which is basically what kind of devices we have in VPP. So we have a DPDK, and that is what I, we are calling the DPDK input. It's basically every, every device driver PMD which DPDK supports. But then we have some native device drivers in VPP, which are like Tuntap, vhost user. So we have a native vhost user implementation. We have a packet uh, interface, a netmap. Uh, SSVM is an experimental uh, VPP only, VPP to VPP shared memory interface, which is let's say uh, currently really in experimental code, so it's not, uh, it's not uh, tested and it, we are missing some functionality there. And finally what we have, and that is actually coming from the days where we are not using DPTK as a driver level, and that is the basically native uh, device drivers for Nix. But we, uh, because the project was started much, much before the DPTK, 
people had to do their own device drivers, and uh, we had a Niantic device driver plus a Cisco Wake device driver in, in the repo, and E1000. Uh, at some point, we decided to move to DPDK, but, but we still have the support in the code for the native device drivers. I don't see a big use of that, but it was just stupid to remove it because it, it can be useful to somebody. And now, when we come to the DPDK integration, uh, this is basically what we are using from DPDK. Uh, we, have, we have, the, of course, the PMD support using the DPDK device drivers. We had a request user DPDK support. Unfortunately, we had to disable this because in uh, 1607 there was a big change in the API and uh, the code in VPP, which is kind of because DPDK request user is was not compatible with the, with the 1607. Uh, but on the other side, we have the native request user implementation, which is actually the default one, so this is not a big issue for the people who are using VPP at, at this point. Then we have a HQS, which Christian was talking, and just Winder were talking about this morning. And finally, the crypto dev stuff, uh, which we are talking today, right? Uh, this is slide just showing some of the features we have. I don't want to spend much time on it, but I guess slides will be available so that we can take a look what exactly we have. It's a bit outdated. I think we have some new stuff on the, in the recent, uh, in the master branch, so you can also take a look there and see what's there. And finally, three slides about performance. So I think it's important to explain how we are dealing with really the high scale setups. So this is the test which actually, testing which actually Magic was doing. So I'm borrowing his slides. Uh, we have a, the biggest setup we actually did is with uh, six uh, fourth wheel NICs in the two socket computer. So basically two NUMA nodes. We had uh, 12 40 gig ports to connect, connect, connected to Ixium. And we had one VPP instance uh, running the, the FIB IPv4 routing with uh, two million routes. And we created the flows on the XCS on the same side. We, are, we were pumping the, the traffic over all 12 the 40 gig ports. And, and actually, we proved that we are basically linearly scaling fully up to the performance of the NIC. So, so I think uh, this is a gigabits per second. I think we are basically hitting the hardware limitation of Fort Hill here. And really, the number of uh, NICs increasing by number of increasing number of NICs, we are really the, always hitting the, the hardware age, hardware limitations. And another slide is talking about uh, uh, PPS rate. Again, uh, hit, we are hitting the theoretical maximum on the NIC. So basically, what I, I wanted to show with these slides is very simply that uh, the multi-threading which we have in VPP is scaling almost linear in the very, very high scale de de deployments. But you can remember how many uh, workers were assigned per, per NIC? Uh, so worker per physical core. Okay. And just a correction to what you said, uh, the limit is not really Fordville, well, Fordville limit, uh, limit on the bandwidth side, but it's PCI limit. Okay. Gen 3 times 8 lanes. So basically, yeah, 50 gig, 50 gig aggregate. Yeah, on the on the on the throughput, it was a PCI limit, right? <coughs> on the on the on the big packets. Correct. On the, on the small packets, we are hitting the the limit. PPS, on the, on yes, the yes. Right? yes. Yes. For the for the right hand side. Yes. yes. Okay. So that's it. Uh, maybe questions at the end. I would like to search to have this slot. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to be talking about enabling IPsec with CryptoDev. Um, I'll talk first about IPsec, what we have done in DPDK and in BPP, um, why we're moving to BPP. Uh, then I'll talk about the design approach that we're taking to integrate CryptoDev into final BPP. I'll show some numbers, preliminary numbers, so, uh, you know, take with a pinch of salt, uh, and then the future work. 
So um, I'll start first with DPDK. We introduced the IPC example app on DPDK 1604. Uh, basically, very basic functionality uh, showing EAS, CDC, uh, HMAC, SHA-1, ESP, Tunnel. So no AH, no IKE, uh, not a lot of features. Um, but it still was, the basic idea was trying to get something uh, a bit more complex than a simple sample application that we have, trying to avoid, avoid the uh, L3-4 where uh, sample application that doesn't really relate to a real uh, router uh, solution. Um, on DPK 1607, we introduced transform mode and IPv6, uh, and in 1611, we're introducing GCM counter and a config file. Now, that will be the last development that we're doing on that DPK sample app. Uh, the reason, like I mentioned, uh, we are lacking a lot of features. Uh, we want to try, we want to try to measure what real IPsec performance we can get in a platform, and for that, we need all the features that uh, an IPsec implementation uh, requires. Um, so, BPP, the first stable release was 16.06. Um, they have an IPsec implementation with OpenSSL. They have IP2 as a responder site only at the moment, but they also have an entry replay window, extended sequence number, nested essays. Uh, you can also set up an IPsec interface for BPN. They also have now L2 GRE over IPsec since, since BPP 16.09. Um, and on the next release, we plan to enable CryptoDev in BPP uh, and also adding EAS, GCM, and dynamic and replay window for uh, high traffic rates. Um, so basically, the idea is trying to get as close as an uh, IPsec solution to measure real performance. Um, I think with BPP, we're a step closer. There are still things like a SA lifetime. Uh, Initiator in IP2, but um, we'll get there eventually. So this is an example of what the v, uh, a VPN IPsec interface in BPP looks like. Uh, like Dave explained before, so basically we're in a, in a graph. Uh, that will be the typical use case without any other sort of encapsulation. We get the packet on the DPDK input, no checksum, get the lookup. We end up in the interface. The interface sent to this IPsec IF input, which is basically an IPsec virtual interface. We do the ASP encryption, go back to IPv4 input, look up again, and then eventually out into the real interface. The design that we are proposing basically, if you enable DPDK uh, crypto, we will be replacing the ASP encrypt, so that node, instead of doing the encryption with OpenSSL, basically it will call the crypto dev library. Uh, you will enqueue packets there, so at that point, the packets are going from DPP, they are down in, in DPDK, and eventually they will come up into a new DPDK crypto input node. Um, so DPDK crypto input node and DPDK input, there will be two input nodes where you get packets. Um, after that, in, in the case of the outbound path, uh, we'll get the packet and we'll say, okay, it was an outbound path, send it to the DPDK SP encrypt post, well, there will be some post-processing, checking that the operation was successful, and then back again to the IP for uh, FIB, and then down the real interface. Uh, BPP, like I was saying, it has all the other modes. This is just the outbound example. Uh, we have full security policies checkup. Um, there are other ways to get also to the DPDK SP encrypt, uh, like l 2 GRE. It's a different uh, set of nodes. I already explained that. Okay. So, uh, so this is basically uh, to show now some preliminary performance number. That was the original setup. Very simple setup, single 10 gig uh, link, basically traffic generator one side, uh, BPP with uh, uh, the POC, the pop that we need for crypto dev element. We have our standard uh, configuration options on the BIOS. Um, basically, one thing to note is just uh, we disable Turbo Boost, so we try to get a, a, a performance that is not going to vary depending on how many cores we're using. That was the configuration that probably doesn't work with the latest BPP because it has changed. Uh, we took this on the BPP 16 of our snapshot, and a few things have changed now on the IP routing. Uh, so, those are the initial performance numbers. 
So what we're calling there OOP, PPP, basically is out of the box PPP. Um, so that is implemented using Lit Crypto. Now there is a few gotchas, not just a comparison between uh, SNI Multipuffer and Lit Crypto. The current implementation of PPP uses random for the generation of the IV. Uh, we don't use random for, for uh, the crypto dev implementation. Um, we can see also like we're also in, all, all using uh, 10 gig link, so uh, we can bridge the limit on around 512 packets on a single core. Um, so, future work. Um, I'm going to be quick here because I already take and uh, talk about it. So, basically, we're looking into the crypto dev load balancer scheduler as uh, the next step. Um, some crypto device uh, PMD improvements, uh, we're trying to improve what we have on GCM, ES, CDC, uh, trying to get uh, use of the new instructions when we get them in, into the core. Um, we are so also uh, looking into adding more algorithms for IPsec, uh, such as GMAC, and maybe not so important, but still uh, part of uh, ES, CDC, 256, uh, a different, different set of algorithms. And, uh, a scattered gather list support. So that once we have the scattered gather list support on crypto dev, we will be also bring it up into the BPP uh, to make use of such a functionality. And questions? That was quick. Question for Damien too, if you have them. Uh. <clears throat> yeah, it's for you, Sergio. And and, and, and it's about, have you seen the, the patch from, uh, on, on the lib on the lib event, the extension for DPDK and that uh, KVM is proposing? And did you check if it makes sense to have all your distribution logics uh, through, through the lib event? Because it seems that uh, you are, both of you are inventing the wheel, you are applying like, a specific use case here, and it seems that uh, Yerin is going to define an API from the minimum I can understand. Yeah, it doesn't it wrongly, but from what I understand, there are some similarities and you have a different API and you could be consuming on this API. So I, I, would, I would like to, to, to check if uh, we are not going to end by 2017 with uh, uh, something that will be specific to crypto in TPDK, uh, while we will have an API that will not be used and uh, unfortunately that could, have, that, that could have been used through this event and API. Okay, so that's a bit more... <laughs> <laughs> so I, th I thought he was uh, talking about the crypto there more than IPsec specific, or maybe I misunderstood. Sorry. It, it's more related to the crypto API. So. Yes, that, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. Uh, Sorry, uh, I'll maybe jump in a bit there on the uh, live event stuff because I've been in following the discussions that have been going on there and as a contact with Jaron on it. I'm not sure how directly comparable that live event API stuff is going to be compared to the kind of scheduler that's going to be needed here that the guys are looking at for the crypto operations. I mean, with live event, we're really looking at per packet scheduling with multiple type operations and multiple logic operations available. You know, the type working with packets while holding locks, whereas for the Scheduling for the crypto, as I understand it, is basically entire burst of packets being looked at in a lot of the cases. And the type of reordering that's going to be needed is only from one or two sources because you're not going to have a dozen cores also in your package. You've got maybe a hardware accelerator and a software um, crypto block. So, in that case, your problem becomes a lot easier. And, and you could probably use uh, the event dev stuff, but I suspect it'd probably be overkill. And the, uh, these guys also want to investigate and what they said. They want to see allow people to put in different uh, scheduling schemes that fit this specific use case. You know, in, in you were saying some tests you did, you you were saying that it worked quite well if you, you just went to hardware and then not filled up, and suddenly you felt uh, you you fall back to software just in that case. That sort of thing is not going to be possible with lib event dev because it's buffering of packets ahead of time and it's not trying to say if this is full and then fall back to the other. So we can see and investigate if there's any similarities, but I suspect that the two 
use cases are sufficiently different that they're going to have to be kept separate. Yeah, so one possible uh, convergence would be like now uh, on this scheme you have N Q and followed by D Q, right? So with the lib event scheme, maybe you can have N Q and uh, on the work completions you can get the events, you can get the crypto work completion as an event back to the system. So you have an N Q, then uh, with schedule you get the events back, right? So th that kind of a scheme, something is can be useful. So. So the, 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 on, on that, actually, the last example that I talked about where you're maybe we're doing, um, using multiple cores, all doing CPU-based processing, then it probably, I think, the live event that would make very much sense to there is the mechanism for spreading uh, the packet load uh, around, but or the main scheduling routines we're thinking of from crypto really is Utilizing multiple devices in conjunction from a single on a single queue, so the, it's it's very much different from a, a queue manager or in the event that the, you're, you're looking at. Maybe you've, you're doing still doing all the in queuing and dequeuing on the same core. It's just you're directing where the processing has happened. I, um, I would see them those as quite different use cases than the lib event dev. Where, where, which might be very applicable to the when you want to do spread multiple work across multiple cores. Right. It's so not yes, not on the scheduling perspective, but uh, the asynchronous notification perspective. It makes some sense. Not on the scheduling perspective. Yeah. So, okay. So I have a question to you know which slide to Sergio. <laughs> which slide? Yeah, no, this one, this one, this one. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, that that one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> <laughs> so the the line rate at ten gig for five twelve packet size. This is bidirectional, yes. Yeah. And this is per card, yes. That's a single core test, yeah. Okay, and uh, the difference between the orange and the bottom I'm kind of so, so blue they are, purple. Yeah, so they're both software implementation now. Uh, we do we do things a bit different. Like uh, like I was saying, uh, on BPP at the moment, they use uh, the random function to create the IV. Uh, so that has also a heavy penalty. Uh, we don't we don't use random for CVC the way we're, we're generating that IV. Uh, we use basically the forward function to generate that IV. Um, so, yeah, you could get that uh, out of the box maybe a bit up. Still, the ASNM multi buffer is going to be a most more performant implementation uh, when you have high packet uh, rate. So the orange line is without hardware acceleration, correct? The orange line would be software with the ASNM multi buffer. So you still need uh, a CPU that supports ASNM instructions. Sure. Uh, and then QAT would be. Everybody has them, yes. Sorry? The ASNI is common uh, for a while now, no? Yeah, yeah. So common, common enough, but I suppose like... Or yeah. Uh, yeah, so they will be coming now with AVX okay. for AVX. So if I fast, if I'm a user, I fast forward to 2017, assuming the Vincent's API um, question is addressed, and this thing is usable, um, and uh, can take non-encrypted uh, communication packets and encrypted, I create uh, non-encrypted tunnels and encrypted tunnels based on some sort of policy. <coughs> uh, I can deploy this software and uh, run it on either hardware accelerator ex equipped computers or not. Same software. Yep. And I can scale it uh, based on need uh, with adding the cards, hardware cards. I can have multiple cards. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Yes to your, to your question. You will be able to do that. So you could have one uh, one hardware offload. You could have multiple cards, and still you will be able to use multiple cores on multiple devices. Mm -hmm. So initially, the first uh, patch uh, will be very limited. It will all uh, base for kind of mapping of cores to to devices. But we plan to introduce CLI commands to be able uh, to the user to uh, you know we want this core to be using software for whatever reason. Uh, so we want we will be adding the, those CLI commands to be able to manage uh, mappings of uh, hardware resources to work of course. Okay. In so I have lots of other questions, but I will reduce them to a single one. Okay. For the bean counters, 
So my problem of uh, cost of introducing crypto comes down to number of cards and PCI slots on a computer uh, so at the end of the day. Yeah. But eventually we may have uh, hardware that provides different, uh, different view. Without the burning PCI slots? You, you may have a board that has more PCI slots, I, I don't know. Uh, just on, on that, if, if you were to use the Niantic um, functionality, which has inbuilt um, in, sorry, inline crypto functionality, then you're, 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 you're then go back to just being limited to the PCI bandwidth required for the Nix. Because the, the, you don't have, so when you're using the hardware accelerator and the setup, you've got two, two extra PCI transactions for every packet, because they have to, or multiple extra PCI, you have trans, transition the packet down to the hardware and then back up. Um, if, if, so, if, you were to, if, you were, if you were using a Niantic device with that inline crypto capabilities of a ESGCM, so it's, it's very limited in what it can do, you would save that, that overhead uh, and then it would just be. So if you're using a NIC functionality that had inline crypto, you would then just be back to what the NIC is capable of doing. Okay, so I said I asked the last question, so I can't ask a question, but can I ask a last comment to your, to your point? Um, if I'm a pin counter and uh, my metric of efficiency is number of cycles, uh, frequency or number of cycles per packet, what is the number of cycles per packet gain by using hardware crypto in this case? Do you have this data, no. roughly? No, I don't have that data. Percentage? Uh, Here it's 50%. I think you're for your best guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, don't have that, I don't have that data. We don't have that data uh, okay. Okay, thank uh, you. For, for cycle count. I mean, you can expect that it's going to be less. Uh, usually it takes us like around three, 400 cycles to offload to QAT compared to, you know, so far, depending how big the package are going to take the heat here. So that's uh, some of the magic that will come when we're looking to the crypto seller how to do proper balancing uh, between hardware and software when you have in the same board and how to manage that. Thanks, guys. We keep things moving along. Thank you very much, Declan, Sergio, Daniel. Okay.